In our headlines on this Friday afternoon, April 19th, here on the Korean Peninsula. Israeli missiles have reportedly hit a site in Iran following days of international speculation about a potential response from Israel to Iran's large aerial assault last weekend. Meanwhile, relevant government authorities are addressing initiatives to reform Korea's healthcare system this afternoon amid the prolonged walkout by the country's junior doctors. Also, President Yoon Sagyal visits the April 19th National Cemetery to share a moment of silence and prayer for protesters who lost their lives on this day in 1960 while seeking to do away with an authoritarian regime. We start with a story that is unfolding as we speak. Israel has fired missiles into a site in Iran, ending days of much international speculation over the size and scope of its potential response to an unprecedented aerial assault by Iran last weekend. Now, citing a senior U.S. official, ABC News reported Israel early Friday morning had launched its retaliatory campaign against Iran. Flights to the Iranian cities of Tehran, Isfahan and Shiraz have been halted after local media reported an explosion in the city of Kajabaristan. Now, this city is situated near Isfahan Airport and the 8th Shekhari base of the Army Air Force in the northwest of Isfahan. Arirang News, for its part, has yet to independently verify details of this latest development. Now, prior to this latest offensive by Israel, Iran had made an unprecedented reference to its suspected nuclear weapons program with a warning against any Israeli attack on its related facilities. Ari Singje reports. With the armed conflict in Gaza still ongoing after more than six months, and Iran and Israel on the brink of a full-blown conflict, tensions in the Middle East continue to rise with each day. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps on Thursday warned that it would target Israel's nuclear sites and may pursue the development of nuclear weapons if Israel strikes Iran's nuclear facilities. The stern warning from Tehran comes after Israeli officials promised a response to Iran's attacks on Israel last Saturday. It's also Iran's most direct warning that it could abandon its policy of refraining from building a nuclear weapon. Currently, Iran is enriching uranium up to 60 percent, a short technical step away from the more than 90 percent enrichment needed for an atomic bomb. Over at the UNSC, the United States vetoed a resolution to stop the United Nations from recognizing a Palestinian state, a move which denied the Palestinian Authority full membership of the world body. The move by the U.S. was also echoed by a U.S. State Department official. We also have been very clear consistently that premature actions in New York, even with the best intentions, uh, will not achieve statehood for the Palestinian people. He added that such a move at the U.N. would statutorily require the United States to seize its funding to the U.N. This marks the second Palestinian attempt to become the 194th member of the U.N. Meanwhile, a planned ground offensive in Rafah may be imminent following a meeting between U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and Israel's security officials. While Washington has expressed its concern over a possible offensive in the southern tip of Gaza due to risks to a large refugee population there, the two sides shared the goal of defeating Hamas. The two sides agree that a ground offensive in the region is necessary in order to completely eliminate the Palestinian militant group. A local Arab media outlet reported that the U.S. government accepted the Israeli military's plan for the Rafah ground operation on the condition that Israel does not retaliate against Iran's airstrike. Lee seung Arirang News. In Ukraine, another drone attack was attempted on Thursday against the Russian-held Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. According to officials appointed by Russia at the plant, the latest attempt comes less than a fortnight following a similar attempt and that Ukraine is responsible for the reckless action. The International Atomic Energy Agency, for its part, has voiced grave concerns over the potential repercussions of such an attack on a nuclear power plant. Ukraine has yet to respond to the accusation. Meanwhile, on the local front, government authorities here addressing details of their health care reform plans this afternoon. Our Kim Jong-shil has the latest. 
The government is speaking on the issue of the ongoing health care crisis for the first time since last week's general election. The meeting on Friday will be organized by the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters and chaired by the Prime Minister's office. Likely to be discussed is the Presidential Health Care Reform Task Force. This social consultation has been set up to discuss the remaining challenges for the reform. The presidential office said the task force could be launched as early as next week. It will have around 20 members, including health ministry officials, groups of doctors, nurses, pharmacists and patients. On Thursday, Health Minister Cho Gyu Hong said that health care reform is a necessary task to protect the lives of the people, re-emphasizing the government's unwavering intention to complete the reform. The government is also speeding up its process to legalize physician-assistant nurses amid fierce opposition from doctors. Meanwhile, school presidents from six universities proposed accepting only half of the government's quota increase for next year. If the government accepts, the medical student quota would be increased by 1,000 places rather than the government's target of 2,000 extra spots. It's been exactly two months since junior doctors nationwide started to submit collective resignations opposing the government's plan to increase the medical student quota by 2,000 next year. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. In other news, President Yoon Suk-yeol commemorated a sad chapter of Korea's path to democracy earlier on this Friday. The president was at the April 19th National Cemetery to share a moment of silence and prayer for protesters who lost their lives on this day in 1960 as they sought to do away with an authoritarian regime. The April 19th revolution is considered one of South Korea's first pro-democracy movements which led to the resignation of then President Seungman Lee or Lee Seungman in the same month. Fluctuations in the foreign exchange market will not pose significant economic challenges for South Korea. Now, this is according to the IMF's director for Asia and Pacific Department, Krishna Srinivasan, during a press briefing in Washington on Thursday. The remarks come amid a dramatic decline in the strength of the Korean won against the U.S. dollar in recent times. He also called on policymakers at the Bank of Korea to focus on seeking domestic price stabi stability, that is, instead of overly focusing on the policy directions of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Staying in Washington, where the world's top finance authorities are gathered, Finance Minister Choi Sang-mok says the government is closely monitoring changes within the foreign exchange market. Also addressing members of the media in the U.S. capital city on Thursday, he added appropriate measures are in place in preparation for all scenarios. With regard to consumer prices, he pointed out the core inflation remains stable, but price fluctuations continue for agricultural products. And broader efforts to address these fluctuations, he vowed, would continue. At the Parliament, ruling and opposition lawmakers are staging a second battle of a controversial grain bill that requires government intervention to stabilize prices of rice. Our National Assembly correspondent Ishihu explains. The National Assembly's Opposition Controlled Agriculture Committee on Thursday directly referred to a plenary session a contentious bill requiring the government to respond to the steep rise and falling grain prices. Eleven main opposition Democratic Party committee members and one independent voted in favor. They were all those present of the 19-member committee as seven ruling People Power Party members had walked out in protest. The revision to the Grain Management Act prompts the government to take active measures to stabilize prices of grain, mainly rice, to help farmers. Such measures include purchasing surplus grain or selling a government-managed inventory of grains. The bill was referred to the Legislation Committee for discussion back in February according to customary procedures. But parliamentary rules also state that a bill pending in the Legislation Committee for more than 60 days can be directly referred to a plenary session if over three-fifths of the original standing committee members agree. 
This is how the Opposition Controlled Agriculture Committee was able to push through the referral of the bill, slightly modified after its original version was vetoed by the President last year. President Yoon Sung yeol rejected the bill in April of 2023, saying that the compulsory purchase of surplus rice using taxpayers' money is not in any way helpful for farmers. A year has passed since, and the PPP against the bill then and now says that a mandatory purchase will lead to even greater production of surplus grain in the long term. The PPP members of the Agriculture Committee released a statement after their walkout Thursday, prompting the DP to join them in coming up with what they call a reasonable alternative. They called the opposition's move a legislative flood in defiance of parliamentary law. The DP members of the committee, too, held a press conference and reiterated the need for a revision, saying that the fluctuating price of grains is threatening farming operations. They said their single-handed referral was necessary for the speedy passing of the bill, while not much time is left for the current assembly. The Agriculture Committee directly referred four additional bills to the plenary session on Thursday, including one establishing a legal basis for the founding of a chamber of agriculture and fisheries for those in the sector to voice their opinions. It's expected the bills will be handled by the current 21st National Assembly during its final extraordinary session next month. Lee shi Arirang News. Korea back on Thursday celebrated the export of its 500 domestically built liquefied natural gas carrier. A naming ceremony for the vessel Orion Spirit, built by Samsung Heavy Industries, took place at the company's Koje shipyard in Gyeongsangnam-do province. The carrier will be delivered to its owner, US-based banking giant JP Morgan Chase, on Friday. This milestone has been reached precisely 30 years after South Korea constructed its first LNG carrier in the year 1994. Vacant homes in one small city here in Korea are being transformed into places of social gathering as local authorities aim to breathe fresh vitality into their communities. Our Lee Soo Jin was there. It's a small coffee shop within an alleyway in the central region of South Korea. A buzz of chatter travels through the air, even though it's a weekday, with most of it coming from this coffee shop. At first glance, it seems like your everyday coffee shop, but it was once an abandoned home. Originally built in the 1950s, the house had been left vacant for 13 years before the owner of the coffee shop decided to purchase and transform it into a space that people would find appealing but he decided to renovate it in a way that would preserve its original form. There are two types of architectural styles here. On this side, you can see elements of Japanese colonial architecture, and on the other side, modern Korean architecture. South Korea has seen a surge in vacant homes from its declining population, with over 130,000 reported across the country as of 2022, nearly half of which are in rural areas. Because vacant homes tend to attract crime, there have been various efforts made by local governments to turn these into community assets. The local administration in Chungju, where this coffee shop is located, provides 10 million won, or around 7,000 U.S. dollars, in renovation grants for those who purchase vacant homes. The owner says these benefits and his own success story have encouraged others to purchase vacant homes, not just in this alleyway, but also in nearby areas. The home vacancy rate stood at 50 percent seven years ago. As of last year, it's at 10 to 12 percent. Lee Jun-young is someone who bought a vacant home on a street 10 minutes away from the coffee shop. Around 80 to 90 percent of my decision to purchase a vacant home was influenced by the success of the coffee shop. He is now the owner of not just his own coffee shop but also a guest house. Locals say that the atmosphere of the town has changed since these vacant homes were transformed. Before, these streets felt run down, but now they have come alive again. She added that she believes the town will continue to flourish as there are other vacant homes currently undergoing renovation. Business owners here say that an ability to see value in the old as well as more monetary government support are what will help not just this town but other areas across the nation with high home vacancy rates come alive again. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News, Chungju. 
And Korea's love for desserts is strong, but it's also rather short-lived. The popularity of a product lasts only as long as the emergence of a new treat. And our Park Gon Woo says this reality should be considered before starting a related business. Do take a look. At South Korea's largest dedicated dessert market, more than 40 brands gather under one roof, selling a range of delightful treats. People began gathering in the mornings, sometimes even in long lines to choose their favorite desserts. I spend about 14 to 21 U.S. dollars a day on desserts, which is more than a meal. I usually get desserts that are pretty and popular on social media. With Korean consumers heavily influenced by social media, content creators have been introducing new dessert items that could drive new trends domestically. I think food content creators are a big part of what makes these snacks go viral. And after they go on social media, there's a domino effect. And with news trends surging rapidly, some desserts suddenly gain popularity before the hype dies down and the trend almost disappears. One example is the Chinese sugar-coated fruit snack, tanguru, that went viral last year. According to data from South Korea's Interior Ministry, around 60 tanguru stores had already closed between the start of 2024 and early April. In the whole of last year, a total of 72 stores across the country shut down. A search online shows posts from frustrated Tanguru store owners saying that they are selling up. That's compared to the situation in 2023, when the popularity of Tanguru resulted in the number of new stores jumping by over 1,300 percent. One expert explained the reason dessert trends change so quickly in South Korea. Due to high stress levels, people have a huge desire for desserts, and many of those have a wide but short trending term. Korean consumers are highly affected by others, so as soon as one item goes viral it withers quickly afterward. He also said people hoping to start a new business should think of the longevity of their products in terms of popularity in order to keep their stores open. Park Geun-hye, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. In the U.S. on Thursday local time, the 12 jury members in former President Donald Trump's historic criminal case in New York have been sworn in. New additions to the jury, an investment banker and a security engineer, were seated after two jurors were excused, one due to an impartiality issue and the other over suspicions the juror may have lied about having a criminal history. The case revolves around a payment of hush money made to a porn star during the 2016 presidential campaign. This is the first criminal trial for a former American president, and it represents a significant challenge to his efforts to regain the Oval Office. It's expected that jury selection for six alternates will conclude on Friday, and the judge presiding over the case has predicted that opening arguments will commence on Monday. Kenya's highest-ranking military officer has died in a helicopter crash. The country's President William Bruto announced in a news conference that General Francis Amandi Ogola was among the 10 people who died in the crash in western Kenya on Thursday. Two people survived the helicopter crash, which occurred shortly after takeoff. The Kenya Air Force has dispatched an air investigation team to the site to figure out the cause of the crash. Agola left Nairobi on Thursday to inspect school renovations and visit troops in the North Rift region. President Ruto convened an urgent Security Council meeting following the crash. Kenya will observe three days of mourning starting on Friday for Agola, who is the first Kenyan military chief to die while in active service. Google fired 28 workers late Wednesday following their protest this week against the company's $1.2 billion cloud computing contract with the Israeli government. Investigations revealed that the protesting employees disrupt work at several U.S. office locations, including Google Cloud CEO Thomas Kurian's office. A company spokesperson said the protests were part of a long-standing campaign by a group of organizations and individuals who are largely unrelated to the company and that the company will continue to investigate and take action as needed. The contract, known as Project Nimbus, involves Google and Amazon providing cloud computing services to the Israeli government and military. Bristol University's robotics scientists have developed a robotic suction cup that can grasp rough, curved and heavy stones. 
The research team examined the adaptive suction abilities of octopus suckers, which allow them to anchor themselves to rocks. The findings were published on April 18th in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Now the researchers are aiming to use sensors inside the cups to make the suckers smarter and enable machines with many suckers to be deployed for industrial purposes. Che Ji-hee, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Air quality levels improved to their normal levels in central regions, but east of Gangwon-do and southern provinces will need to stay alert against high levels of yellow dust again. Then it should be as warm as yesterday in most parts. Seoul topping out at 24, early summer-like in Daegu and Gyeongju at 28 and 29 degrees Celsius under sunny skies in most places. Then there is much needed nationwide rain in the forecast this weekend, starting from Jeju and the south coast early tomorrow. Rain should help to clear the lingering dust in the air, but also bring down the highs. Now the further south will see heavier rainfall with thunderstorms and strong winds on the south coast in Jeju. And this band of rain will continue into Sunday morning. We are already heading into the end of April. Next week looks more promising with more wide temperature gaps between lows and highs. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. Right, and those are the headlines at this hour here in Korea on this Friday afternoon. Coming up next is our panel session, and today we address the hostilities between Israel and Iran.